a new documentary is uh, about to uh, begin playing in cinemas in Australia, a documentary called Love in Bright Landscapes, a really interesting documentary about David McComb and the Triffords, of the Triffords. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer-director of Love in Bright Landscapes, Jonathan Alley. Jonathan, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Great to be here, Peter. Thanks for having me. Good to talk to you. And this is such a fascinating documentary about uh, a rather enigmatic man who was a, a great musician and poet and, and yet had uh, such a difficult life um, and, and death, of course. Tell me about how it all came about, because this is your first feature film, that you were able to make this film. Sure, it is my first feature film, although I've been involved in the film industry and had a kind of music and, uh, to a lesser degree, a theatre background before I, I made it. In 2007, actually, no, 2006, I, I got involved in the making of a film about the Australian instrumental trio, The Dirty Three. Uh, one of uh, the members of The Dirty Three is Warren Ellis, who worked with David and the Red Ponies and now plays in Nick Cave's band, The Bad Seeds, and also um, works with him in a duo format. So I, I watched that film get made and I learned a little bit about it. I was the writer researcher on that film. And I'd also been working in the film industry. By the time I worked on that film, uh, for about 10 years working in distribution, I'd been working for a company called Mad Man Entertainment. Um, and just learned a lot by watching. I learned a lot about distribution, a lot of, learned a lot about how deals work and a lot about how the, the broad sort of industry operates. Um, before that, I had had a theatre background, so I learned a lot about characters and tension and storytelling and, and the sort of tenets of, of how to build and deliver a story, which is equally as important in documentary as, as with any other filmmaking form. Um, as to how it all happened, I met David in 1994, um, interviewing about interviewing him about a solo record he had made at that point called Love of Will, which is covered in the film. And I had also seen him play solo by that point and also as part of the band called the Black Eyed Susans, which he formed in 1989 in Perth, was kind of a satellite member of by that stage. Um, and he passed away about five years after I met him and I'd always wondered what had happened to him. But even before that happened, um, I'd come to the realization that the Triffids really didn't sound like anybody else. Now, Peter, as you would know, there's a lot of bands. There's a lot of, there are literally millions of records in the world, you know, from the last hundred years of recorded music making, as, and even more songs. So when you come across a catalog that sounds as unique sonically as David's did, and does, and uh, carries with it the imagery and imagination and poise and sheer uh, commitment to quality that his carries, and also the wildly intuitive nature of the um, music behind the, the songwriting, usually, uh, more often than not in his catalogue, executed by the Triffids. It's a fairly unique combination. So I wondered what had happened. And I also wondered why somebody who created something that I think is a really brilliant and special body of work in the broader Australian arts just hadn't really been recognised beyond a kind of cult following. And I thought, well, you know, uh, no one else is doing it, so bugger it, I will. <laughs> What a terrific background and explanation to the uh, to the making of this film. It uh, <laughs> that 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 was uh, excellent, and and you're right. The music of the Triffids, uh, the songs, uh, and Dave, of course, being so uh, instrumental in all of that, uh, are really such wonderful songs. Beautifully composed, had a lot to say, and and you're right. I mean, how could a band like that, even though uh, there were, of course, there's lots and lots of them. But this one was quite a distinctive um, a setup, uh, the Triffids and, and David's work. Uh, how could it uh, be relegated to cult status and not be given the recognition that it deserved in the music industry? That, and I'm so glad that you investigated <laughs> that. <laughs> well, I think to answer that question, Pete, you only need to look at the music industry in the 1980s, which is the era in which they operated right you know 
it was a far less multi-dimensional place than it is now. And it's still a pretty desperate, cynical, um, narrow kind of environment these days. It's a, it's a different pile of neuroses than it was in the mid eighties, granted, but still pretty awful. But if you go back to the time that the Triffids were trying to make a fist of some sort of commercial success, which they did want, and there's no point in beating around the bush about this. They, they wanted to be commercially successful. They didn't want to play to, to, to 300 people at the pub for all their lives. They wanted to be a successful band and make money from being a band. But they wanted to do it, and this is so important, they wanted to do it on their own terms and not make compromises. So if you look at the environment around them, the 80s were very monocultural. Yeah. Uh, people romanticise the 80s now, you know, but people forget that the 80s were awful. <laughs> I mean, you are, if you went to a dinner party in the 80s, you were probably listening to Spandau Ballet and Howard Jones. Or maybe if you went to a party, there'd be some awful hair metal playing. It was a really, really depressing time to be a music fan um, because everything was hung up on fashion. But as I say, it was one dimensional. Everyone was reading the same magazines, watching the same television programs on music. There's no YouTube. You know, you can watch Radio Countdown and maybe, you know, something else on channel something. You know, uh, radio is, is pretty straight-laced. In fact, it's very straight-laced, even more straight-laced than now. Um, for a band like the Triffids, I mean, they, they sounded not only ahead of time, but also quite at odds with the sort of prevailing fashions around them. They were never going to be commercially successful. They just weren't. Ha <laughs> ha. How, how interesting. And I, I do agree with you about the music of the 80s. It, it was pretty uh, vanilla and one dimensional in many respects and so on. But I, I'm so intrigued because there is so much in this documentary. You've, uh, Jonathan, you've had obviously so much access to home movies, yeah. to material, to a whole raft of uh, information and material uh, and interviews about David. So harnessing all that must have been quite a challenge for you. Very much so. I mean, people ask me why the film took so long. And the answer is because we wanted to get to the gems and jewels and the treasure trove to bring him to the screen in the most vivid way possible without talking about him. You know, you can have talking heads talking about somebody really easily. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of those talking heads you get aren't people who were involved in the life story. There are observers. Some of them are perfectly good observers with perfectly valid things to say. Um, but a lot of them weren't part of the story. They're coming from it from afterwards. So we wanted people to interview who were part of the life story. And we wanted to give something uh, to the audience which matched the quality of Dave's music. And so much as we could, we could at least aspire to uh, give the audience as something, you know, as elegant and original and kind of offbeat. And I think the home movies do this very well and so do a lot of the big blown up 35 millimeter color slides, particularly when we combine them with David's poetry. Um, I think, you know, we achieve in moments anyway, um, what we aspire to do. But, you know, that's certainly one of the reasons the film took so long and, and I'm, I was never going to hurry it. And I'm really glad I didn't. Uh, absolutely, because I, I'm so glad you used so much of the music and of his poetry um, that uh, it really permeates the film and you get a terrific snapshot uh, of what he was, uh, he was like. And I'm really intrigued into the personal demons that, uh, that David had, I mean, based on his background, based on uh, the health issues that he had early on when he, when he took drugs and drank and so on, but then later with the heart transplant and so on. Quite an extraordinary life. Um, and I suppose detailing that in your film uh, was so important to, to show how it all worked for him uh, and how it reflected on, in the music and the poetry of the Triffids. Insofar as we could. I mean, a lot of that material you're referring to story-wise happens after the Triffids end. Um, but certainly a lot of those darker 
emotions he's experienced are expressed musically, even though it's after the, the Triffids have finished. That's certainly, mm. certainly true. Um, look, in terms of all those personal things, to, sorry to, you know, to coin a phrase, I mean, there's a song called Personal Things on Born Sandy Devotional, but what I mean is um, a lot of it is utilising material that was given to us by the family and filmmaking being the process that it is, it's difficult to know what someone is really feeling, um, even when they've written it down on paper. You know, you might just be capturing a moment in time. You can't know whether that diary entry that they've written or that postcard or that letter is wholly representative of their emotional state that day. It could just be the, the shit 20 minutes they were having, like we all do. Hmm. But I also do take your point that by the end of Dave's life, certainly he, um, whilst he's not lost confidence in his ability to write, and he never did, and nor did his very high standards of quality control ever waver, I think he had come to a realisation that his physical issues had were overtaking him and would eventually overtake him. And that's a pretty hard thing to live with. You know, and the other thing I think about Dave really, is he was just desperately unlucky um, in so many ways, but particularly with, with, you know, what happened with his heart, because there are so many people who have done so many worse things to themselves mm. who are still alive. Very, very true. And uh, yes, a lot of it does come up, to, uh, come into fate and luck and, and so on. With the family giving you so much material and support, uh, Etc. to to make this uh, documentary, were there any um, issues that they had about what you could cover, what you couldn't cover, or what were no go areas? Because I'm I'm quite intrigued sometimes when uh, a family is involved with a documentary, how much control they might have had. Sure, good question. That's a fair question. Um, the family kind of appointed Robert McComb, David's. Um, elder brother the third youngest of the four brothers uh, who was a member of the Triffids to be the kind of family representative and Rob well, Rob first off Rob lives in Melbourne uh, which makes it practically you know very easy um, the other two brothers when we were making the film were both living overseas so it was logical for Rob to kind of be the family representative uh, Harold and Athel, David's parents, were, were getting on in years and indeed sadly passed away before the film could be completed. Uh, that said, I'm so grateful and happy that they're both in the film. Mm. Um, Rob really gave us the freest of free hands. I mean, he saw several different edits of the film, several different cuts of it, and never once did he say, I don't want you to say that. He realises that his brother was an enormously talented person who deserves a documentary. But at the same time, more than most people, really, Rob is you know, quite aware of, of David's frailties as a human being. And, I, and he was very, very pragmatic, actually, in saying, well, if you don't present the side of David, you're not really doing the job you need to be doing. Um, so we were very grateful for that support and for him being so understanding. Um, and so really the answer to your question is they didn't interfere in the least. Interesting to hear that. that that's a, a really solid point for you in terms of giving you carte blanche pretty much to, uh, to make the film that you wanted to make. So, uh, and you've already alluded to this, as you say, you've taken quite a while to make this film. Um, tell me about the editing process, because I can imagine with so much material on offer, um, fashioning that into the tightly constructed film that we now see, uh, Love in Bright Landscapes, um, must have been quite a, a task for you. It was a pretty big task. Uh, we didn't really start editing till about 2017. Um, halfway through that editing process, 500 new stills from the family, uh, well, actually rather from the estate, were offered. And we felt that we had to, you know, we had to include those. Um, in the middle of the editing process, we're also, you know, looking at which television 
properties we can license, which, how much music we can have, because all these things inform how you will use all the other material. Um, we, did, we worked uh, with two editors. We had a rough editor called Greg Appel, who was in a band called The Lighthouse Keepers, who were contemporaries of the Triffids, and Tony Stevens, who's worked on a number of, of really fine Australian documentary films. And they were both really great to work with in that they both brought their complementary strengths as people and as, as professionals um, to the film in a, in a really kind of suitable way. And they're very different from one another, but their particular two styles as both rough and fine editors really suited what we were doing. Um, Greg in particular could empathize as a musician and Tony could emphasize, uh, emphasize excuse me, empathize very much from the point of view of storytelling. Um, so we were lucky that way. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff and inevitably in something like this, there's a lot of stuff that hit the cutting room floor. Um, you know, one day there'll be a, a, a 10 Burr, you know, 10 DVD, Ken Burns DVD set of this, I'm sure, because there's so much stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it could be someone else's headache, not mine. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the editing process was very much, I mean, the stuff I cut that the editors haven't touched, which is still in the film, a lot of the more sort of, um, a lot of the elements where we're marrying home movies of music, I cut in say an afternoon and they're pretty much the way they were the day I cut them. The editors haven't touched them. Um, there are certain other sequences too that are pretty much wholly mine, but that they've really improved. Um, the In the Pines sequence, when they go to the Woolshedder Maker record, for example, is, 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 is one of those. Um, but, you know, uh, David, I think, really worked from gut instincts on what he was doing artistically pretty much all his life. And that's the attitude I took to this film. Sometimes people would ask me, well, why did you make that decision? And all I could really say was, well, it just sort of felt right to do. And in, in an editing suite, when someone wants a reason for something, that doesn't often make a lot of sense. And then three weeks later, they'd say, oh, I get you now. <laughs> you know? But on the other hand, what you've really got to remember as a writer director is that a lot of projects fail because, you know, someone thinks they're an auteur. Um, you know, this business is about listening. You've, you know, my editors would always give my ideas what they call their day in court. Um, and if I could justify my ideas, they'd say, okay. And if I couldn't, ultimately they'd say, well, I don't think this should be in the film. You know, it's a matter of really listening to people. And sometimes, you know, you hold them or you fold them. Sometimes you, you got to stand your ground and say, no, I am going to do this. And other times you just have to say, well, you know, my instinct tells me you're right. So we're not going to do this. But when I made those decisions, they were usually based on instinct, nothing, you know, based on intellect. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about what they were saying. I was sort of feeling whether they were correct or not. And they, when they were, I think we all made the right decision. I think you, you did because the, the film has turned out to be uh, uh, extremely uh, winning in, in terms of uh, presenting uh, David McComb. Uh, and so uh, all of that is great. And you also had some really good people behind you. I mean, Tate Brady uh, as a producer uh, and uh, Stephen Amos, who I know quite well uh, has been involved. So you have some ex excellent people who are making sure that you are producing something um, or directing something that is a uh, first class effort. Oh, look, those guys have been great, particularly Tate. He's been quite instrumental in getting the film finished. The thing with Tate Brady is that he's just so experienced. Mm. And, you know, um, in terms of uh, uh, ensuring we're able to get a producer offset from Screen Australia, um, introducing the film to certain distribution screening networks and, you know, industry places where we may not have been able to show it um, without his involvement has been instrumental. That said, we had pretty much finished a fine cut of the film before he got involved. Um, you know, he, he has been instrumental in shepherding us through the last processes to get it finished. And um, as I say, we're very grateful for his involvement. Um, 
you know, but I'd put someone like Tony Stevens in the same category. He's a fantastic editor. Um, and it was because of our relationship with the Documentary Australia Foundation that we were introduced to Tony and um, very grateful that they did that because, you know, it, this business is all about the right person. And he just ended up being the right guy. And Tate was good that way too. I mean, you know, he, he had these networks. For example, when we did the audio mix, um, he introduced us to Paul Shanahan from Final Sound. And, uh, you know, he was absolutely the right person to run the audio mix in terms of the resources and people that he was able to bring to it. So, you know, uh, very lucky that way. But I guess that also goes back to the industry experience I had uh, for years working at Madman and, and sort of, you know, meeting a lot of good people. Um, but good people aren't always the right people. And you need the right people. And I don't, we would not be in a position where we finish the film and be able to exhibit it and also battle through COVID without the right people. There's just no way. Yeah, I uh, absolutely understand that. And it's now, of course, uh, great to see the film is getting distribution uh, and, it's been yeah. uh, and it's been released across Australia. And that's terrific because uh, it's documentaries like this that need to be seen and preferably in a cinema. Well, you're so right. Um, the only way for documentary makers to make real money is still, believe me, on a cinema screen. Obviously, there is always the TV sale that one is, is you know, fighting for. Um, but you don't tend to get things like TV sales without some decent theatrical behind you. Now, of course, there are other options that exist in you know, our day and age. There's still a small collector's DVD market, and there will be for this film. And obviously, there's streaming as well. But in terms of the experience of this film, I absolutely want people to go into a cinema and really feel it. You know, see the visuals on the big screen and hear the sound mix we've done because it's the optimal way of experiencing a movie. It just is, you know, and I like sitting on the couch and watching Netflix as much as the next person, but, you know, there's nothing like the theatrical experience. There's really not. And I think in terms of um, if you're a fan of, of music or poetry or art, um, the rewards of seeing our film in a cinema will be tenfold. Absolutely. I fully endorse that. And I'm wondering, too, uh, your film, just like a number of other music documentaries of, uh, uh, of musicians mm -hmm. and, and so on of the past, whether this will create a new interest in the Triffids and in David McComb, of course, um, and so that there'll be much more interest in playing that music and having that music available. Yeah, I mean, um, there are always people... Um, you know, newly engaging with David's work and some of them will be through this film. But I just say that there's been a renaissance underway for Dave's work for 20 years and it's not really showing any signs of abating. You know, um, the Triffids started to reissue their catalogue in the mid-2000s. His books of, uh, a book of his poetry was posthumously published, as we mentioned in the film. Um, there's been a biography written of him by the photographer Bledford Butcher. Uh, there's been a collection of writings on David uh, published through Fremantle Arts Press called Vagabond Holes. You know, um, good art sticks around. And I think somebody like David, the appreciation for him only grows. Um, I think our film, um, and I'm pleased that it's well received, of course, but it's only one of a number of projects that have... Um, been instigated partially to give him his due and I think you know partially because I think that the sort of errant discomfort in the Triffids music makes much more sense in 2022 than it ever did in 1986 hmm. so there's that it, it's that it's it's time artistically has actually come around again um which is neither here nor you know it's that's not to do with whether people are making films or books I just think the the state that the world finds itself in suddenly that disquiet that's kind of juxtaposed with the romanticism of the Triffids makes a lot more sense again, you know, yep. um, whereas in the generic 80s, it, it did not. Mm. Um, so there's that. But also, I also just think that um, at the end of the day, okay, a lot of these songs might be set against rivers and seascapes and beaches and estuaries, but they're basically, as Dave says at the beginning of the film, a bunch of tearjerker love songs. <laughs> and, wow, well, man, there are 8 billion people on this planet and they're all pretty different from one another 
You know that, but I'll tell you this, no matter what your ethnicity, what your gender, what, you know, what background you have, however you identify, whatever, whoever the hell you are, you are going to fall in love. It's going to happen to you. You know, and apart from the fact that we make art, that's one of the things that separates us from animals. And uh, David wrote about that better than just about anybody. And I think that's a real reason his, his, his art and his music survived. I think that's a terrific comment. I've, I absolutely agree with you uh, and endorse that. Jonathan, just to conclude, I must ask you, are you working on any other projects at the moment? Well, like any good filmmaker, there's a couple of screenplays in the bottom drawer. Um, they're not in an advanced state. Um, certainly no documentaries. Um, been too busy with this one. Mm. But I like the idea as a writer of just being able to make something up, you know, without the stricture of, of documentary um, where you have to deal in, in facts and, you know, truths and, um, well, even not necessarily truths, but you have to deal in accurate information. Whereas with a kind of dramatic piece, you can just make something up. You can just create a character out of nowhere so long as it makes logical sense in the story. Um, you can do anything. So writing uh, in that vein definitely interests me because it would be immensely freeing after doing this documentary. But I'm not sick of David and I probably never will be. Fair enough too. And uh, and just to, to uh, finally conclude... <laughs> <laughs> finally conclude mm. um are there are there any particular films or filmmakers who either have influenced you or you really appreciate and you uh, like viewing oh sure um i mean if you look at a lot of that rural sort of western australian footage the filmmaker in my mind when i shot a lot of that was vim vendors ah. but fun Funnily enough, what I was really thinking of was not really so much Vim Vendor's filmmaking, uh, but his cinematography. And his cinematography was all done by a wonderful German man called Robbie Mueller, mm. who also shot a lot of films for Jim Jarmusch. Yeah. So stylistically, definitely those two guys. Um, Documentary-wise, it's very hard for me to, to ascribe a particular style that's influenced what I do because of primarily, you know, the, the real kind of influence on this film stylistically has been the story and the person behind it. So I've never, you know, created camera angles or storytelling devices based on a particular documentary filmmaker for this film. But I have, I have you know, created little homages and certain... Uh, you know, certain looks have been influenced by other people, like probably Vim Benders and Jarmusch, as I mentioned. Fair enough, too. OK, and, and uh, I can sort of see that. Look, uh, we've been speaking to Jonathan Alley, who is the writer-director of Love in Bright Landscapes, releasing in Australian cinemas now. And uh, go and see it. It really is a, a fascinating documentary. And if you love music, you will enjoy this film. Uh, thank you so much for talking with me, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. Great to be on your show and, and all the best with it in the future. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye now.